And we're on, and today's guest, we've got Colin McLaughlin, um, SES hero, turned off a motivational speaker. You've also been on the hit show, Who Dares Wins, SES. Um, how are we, brother? Yeah, good, mate. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you. First of all, thanks for inviting me at your home, and, and thanks for coming on the show. Um, obviously, you've got a great story. Um, if you want to talk about how it all started, when you first joined the army and stuff, what age, and then we'll basically take it from there. There's no questions, it's just a case of just talking. Um, on your go, brother. Yeah, I, I joined from a, quite an early age. I was 15, and like a lot of guys, especially that joined the military and the infantry, uh, came from a kind of almost a broken home, stuff going on. And the military was like a second family to me, so that's kind of how I, how I grew up. And um, mum wrote a letter, special permission to join at that age. And I made the best of it, like anything. I never really wanted to join the army, like a, a lot of young guys did but I just I mean I made the best of it and um, got to enjoy it and by the time I was 23 thought I'd put my papers in for for selection and like any in any environment you're in you want to be the the best version of yourself and the best version of what it is you're doing and for me that was special forces so that was it joined joined up went down to Hereford and I, I joined at a real fortunate time I joined the right squadron at the right time and we had a lot of um, quite high profile operations that I was lucky enough to be involved with and left after my, my capture in 2005 um, and since then been involved in TV, book, motion capture, video games, charities, ambassadors and public speaking. Yeah, you've done you've done some magic things man. It's, uh, when you first joined at 15 then, was that, was that a scary part for you especially if you didn't want to join? Yeah, particularly. I was in with a lot of guys that were a lot older than me, a lot bigger, a lot stronger. I wasn't particularly big. I wasn't particularly fit. Um, I wasn't really convinced that the army is where I wanted to be. I wasn't particularly enthused by violence and guns and stuff. But I found uh, I found a way to make myself good at those things and make myself valuable within the environment I was in. So, yeah, I just uh, I kind of made the best of it and grew up quite quick. So is that just basically like adapting to this... The, your environment and just learning as you go. Yeah, and it's a good way to look at it. It's like anything, and you look at the army historically, and that's always what they've done. They've adapted to different environments, whether it's the desert, the jungle, urban environment, and become better at their enemy in the environment they've worked in. And I guess for me, that was the same. I, I was in that environment, I wanted to make the best of it. Because you're one of the youngest as well, 23, you'd passed the SES first time as well. Yeah, past first time. I was 23 when I went on selection. I've probably been younger uh, since or probably before, but 23 is quite young. Mm. Kind of generally mid-20s to, to kind of early 30s is the, is the kind of average age. How was the training? Is it tough? And how long? Yeah, so the training is slightly different from selection. The training, I got a week off. Um, my, my OC at the time, Guy Richardson, really, really, really good guy. He doesn't stay far from here and ended up uh, coaching the British Lions. He was my OC at the time and he let me away just before selection to, to go and train for it. I, I'm not sure I had a real good idea of what I was training for and that might be a good thing because if you know what's in store for you, sometimes you can... Mm -hmm. You can fail yourself before you start. But we didn't have any Royal Scots in the SES, so I had nobody really to ask. We had a couple of guys that went on and failed quite early on, so I didn't really have a knowledge of it. But I trained for the, the things that I knew about, and the rest of it I just took each day as a t time, because it's six months, it's quite a long process, so you, you kind of have to break it down like any long yeah. thing and make it work. What happens if you get injured or that during the course of the, the training? Is that you out, or do you need to start again, or...? Yeah, if you're injured enough to not be able to make times, then yeah, you, you have to come off. And, and that's part of it, is staying injury free. It, it's a long time, six months. So you need a bit of luck as well. People talk about, oh, you just got to be fit or whatever. But I, I think a lot of it is luck and being able to keep physically robust, but equally as important, if not more, is the mental side of it. Obviously, we're here today to talk about one of the major talking points, which is PTSD. It's... It's really bad, you know, and I like I say, it's a, a very hot topic just now. It should be a hot topic every day. Um, I think there's 10 troops killed herself for the last 12 days. Um, Aye, and, and, and you see that every now and again you'll get a, a spike and it will come to the public's attention and then it maybe dissipate without any real positive action coming out the end of it. So it'd be good to see things like this raise awareness and some positive action coming out of it. We have a lot of, probably too many military charities out there now 
And if anything, it can be a bit of a minefield for veterans knowing exactly where to go. I think one of the things that we, we lack at the minute is a kind of 24 seven emergency helpline app website that people can tap into in the early hours when they're feeling vulnerable for whatever reason and get the support they need. And to date, that, we don't really have that. Because everything is the mindset. When you get captured then, was it Basra? Yeah. How long were you held hostage for? It was only a day. I was captured in the morning and rescued that night. And like you say, a lot of that's just mindset. And for me, when I, when I do talking, I talk about that mindset because sure, selection and training in the SES will prepare you for capture and stuff. A lot of it I take back to my childhood though, you know, being locked in a room, being beaten up, that was stuff I was used to. I was comfortable in that environment. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very hard to train people, beat them up repeatedly to train them for that. Mm -hmm. But the mindset's key to that. If you've been somewhere in your mind before, it's easier to prepare, like in any elite sport or, or, or any emergency service. So that's a, obviously a difficult thing. So all the, the stuff that you come back from the past as well, that is, like I say, mental. So you, you adapt and you kind of get used to it. Do you think for the things, people in the army as well, do you believe, do you believe in wars as such as well? Do you believe it's that it's their way forward? Because obviously I've read that you are more chance of committing suicide coming out of the army than you've actually got in war. You, it's like two times as higher to actually die in battle. So you've got more chance of actually committing suicide because obviously the, the, the catastrophic stuff that people must see, it's no good for like human beings to kind of see that stuff. I think it comes down to a number of things. It's quite complex, but one of the things is we're, we're trained for war. So we've been through war-like scenarios in the past. So mentally we've prepared for some of it we're not mentally prepared from when we leave and the support isn't there. And that's different to what happens to, to veterans when they've been in the service where they're, they're, they do a, an element of training for war and then there's support while they're there. But when they come out, A, the training isn't there for things like CV, house stuff, what happens if you get in trouble with drugs, alcohol, and just paying the bills, holding down relationships that have been probably fragile because they've been in the military. Those sort of things can are just the little things that can tip people over and where the support mechanisms aren't in place, there's not a safety net, to, safety net to catch them, that's when you can get problems. And we already know that those guys within those middle years are, are the, probably the most at risk, even out with the military. So if you put the military stuff on top of that, it stands to reason they're the highest at risk. Yes, because the stats are 75% of suicide are male. So, it is, so what, who do you think is to blame then? Is it governments then for, are not enough? for especially people who are serving in the army, for when they come out to have the safety nets there for somebody to go and speak to. Because as men, especially if you're in the army, it's, a, it's, it's tough. So for people to admit they've got a problem and they've got demons in here they're battling. So I'd imagine it'd be tough to go and speak about the things they've seen, deaths or whatever. Do you think there should be a bigger safety net for, do you think that should get put in place when you first start the army? So when it comes out that it's already there and you kind of understand it a wee bit more? Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot there. And I think that, that there's, there's a number of different layers that you can put in place. And certainly the, the blame game is part of it, who's accountable. But I think along that journey, there's a lot of things we can put in place to prevent long term some of these issues become life threatening. So when somebody at the entry level joins, there, there's a certain element of, of support and, and, and kind of forewarning for stuff. And, and post-traumatic incidents, there's a certain amount. So certainly if I speak about the capture, I did the capture after that, uh, no debrief, no decompression, no time out. It was just from one job to another. And I, 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 I wouldn't condone that. I, I just think that there's, there's, we can do better to help people get the best chances of not having stuff after it. And there's things in place. The other time is that little period between people leaving the service and when they've just left, because that's a critical time and a lot of servicemen and women, when you speak to them, hand in their ID card and the next day they feel like they've fallen off the edge of a cliff because suddenly they've, they've no, nothing around them. And I think that could be an easier transition where we put people in place, back geolocated, back in their own home location with a support network around them. Mm -hmm. I think it's because they've got a lot more time in their hands. They're probably used to being busy all the time, regimented, getting up early and being kind of told what to do. So then when they come back into normality, it's easy to go, fuck me, and they don't, their, their head's a bit all over the place. Because there's a man I'm watching just now called Joe Dispenser. Um, he's all about the mindset. So if, what happens is if you think about that trauma, it releases a chemical, and it relates to that emotion, how you felt that time. So if you were thinking about maybe your youth, 
or all the trauma it releases that chemical so the brain doesn't know if that's happening present moment or back in the past and that's when it can trigger all the bad stuff so for you when you get when you went through your capture and stuff how did you deal with that did you deal with it pretty easy or did you try and block it out or how did how did you deal with it have you struggled with ptsd I, i've i've struggled with a lot of symptoms that are linked to ptsd like sleep loss and right. hyper uh, vigilance in places and stuff like that and those are all atypical symptoms and a lot of veterans will tell you they have same symptoms to more or less a degree um, to the effect where they're impacting on the lives and stuff. I think right after the the incident, it was so raw, I just kind of got on with it. But kind of research has shown that any really um, high traumatic incident you've been through can take up to about 12 years to reach a peak. And that's sometimes when it can surface. And it can be triggered for a whole number of different reasons, depending on what's going on in your personal life. For me, I felt like over the last probably two years, that's come to a peak for me where it's come to a period where I've, I've lost sleep, I've overanalyzed things, I'm hypervigilant in places. Or I've had elements of those symptoms before, but they haven't been as bad to the effect where you're losing sleep, where you're, you're, you, know, you forget where you're going and you're, you become clumsy and stuff like that. And those are all pretty atypical symptoms. Mm-hmm. So you must have had a good strong, did you have strong people around you as well, friends you could speak to? Because you've done you've done great things, especially with the motivational speaking and then being on um, who did, is the Channel 4 SAS, who dares wins? Yeah, and I think the, t- the TV, sh- that, that particular series has shown one side of it and it, that, that mental side always trumps the physical yeah. and m- that mental side is key to everything and, and they kind of balance each other and anybody... You know yourself when you when you when you're balancing the mental and the physical, they complement each other. If you feel good, you train better, and if you train train better, you feel well, and they kind of all endorphins are going, and they, they, they complement each other. When one of those is out of sync, it always affects the other one. But for me, the mental side is always that one that's had control. And you look at any of the elite sports stars when it comes to the the top level, and they're in a final, and it's six sets all in a tie break or it's a penalty shootout. It's nothing to do with te- technical ability. It's nothing to do with physical. It's all mental. It comes down with the mindset because they always they always go that extra, but the extra inch is the fear. They learn how to control it. You've got, whether you're going to do stand-up comedy or like go do acting, whatever it is, motivational speaking, the fear's always there, but we can utilise it to either create or else we go backwards and the fear also, also destroys because everything is the mindset and I'll, I'll constantly keep repeating it. So what's the next steps? We, the, the you think should be getting put in place then because obviously th- this probably happens every day with, with 10 people getting lost in 10 days and committing suicide obviously the, so, the, the media is kind of the mainstream media has jumped on it so what what should be the plans or the, the things to get in place to try and create the change and create the massive awareness to say right enough's enough it needs to fucking stop do you know what I mean yeah I think there's a number of things in the short term we need a 24-7 trusted device app website phone line that veterans know they can tap into and speak to like-minded people so for me that's training veterans to speak to veterans not them speaking to doctors and psychs they'll do so much good but you, you want to speak to someone that speaks the same language that has been through the same stuff because they can relate back to you how a, they or their friends have come through the other side of that dark tunnel, whereas a psychologist will give you it from a you know, Freudian perspective or stuff. And I'm not saying they won't do good, but I think people that speak your language will probably help you along that path better. So that's the first kind of short-term stuff. And we're doing a lot of that at the minute with Who Dares Cares and JP Morgan are building up our app so that hopefully at the end of this month will go live and that'll be a 24-7 capability but long term, I think the MOD have to tie into local communities and networks and be able to have a plan from when a person leaves all the way through until the end of their life because they have a duty of care. You know, that duty of care, if you're signing up to say, I'm going to put my life on the line, I'm going to, my family will be my second priority and I'm going to go and do all this stuff, then there has to be a duty of care that as you leave and go into, into Civvy Street, you're going to give them the best chances because there's a support network around you. Mm-hmm. It is scary to think, though, that the numbers are so high. Do you, since you've been in the army, have you lost a lot of people from suicide as well? Yeah, I've lost a lot of people. And one of the reasons we set up the charity is because after my public profile was raised a little bit through the TV and stuff, I was getting contacted through social media by guys that were struggling and women and just saying, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to get out of bed this morning. I'm struggling with 
with alcohol, with drugs, getting a job, my confidence. Um, and I, I would lose I would lose these people every few weeks. One would just disappear off the radar and I'd find out they committed suicide. And having s- spoken through to uh, Cami through at Hamilton, we decided to set up Who Dares Cares. And um, since then, I'm glad to say we've saved a lot of lives, but we can only do with what we, what we have. So it's, it's growing networks and having them in place so that no matter where you are in the UK, there's somewhere for you to, to tap into. And where can people contact you then? Where can, where can people get this information? Who are in the struggle? Is it just servicemen or can it be anybody? No, one of the things about Who Dares Cares is it's for anybody that's encountering stress. Right. We advertise emergency services, so we have people from fire service, prison service, NHS, police, but primarily most of the people, as you would expect, are veterans that get in touch with, with stress issues. We're on Facebook, we have our website, our app will go live at the end of the month, we'll have a dedicated phone line that will be manned 24-7. And if we can't help, we're tapped into other agencies that can and we can sign post and help. So anybody can contact you. So if anybody's in the struggle, man, just pick up the phone or message on Facebook. There's also um, Chrissy's House in Mushaw, who's a 24-hour suicide centre for anybody. Just pick up the phone and phone because that's the scary part, Colin, especially in the army. You've got the bravado, I'm tough, this and that. But as men, it clearly shows that we're not tough if 75% of suicides are male. And it's and it's and the numbers are rising massively each year. Do you think we should be? Do you think schooling comes into play with this as well? Getting taught to how to handle feelings and emotions from a young age, instead of bottling it up and in time we hit t- t- 20s, twenties, thirties, it just comes crashing, and that's when the mental side is pretty all over the place. Absolutely, I think mental health, but right across the board, of course, any corporate organisation, sports team, whatever, if you've got the right mental health uh, support networks in place your productivity, whatever it is you're doing is going to be better. I think that mental health, um, I think there's things you can do as long as you create platforms so that people know where to go and how to make that first step in terms of having the conversation. From there, it gets easier and easier and easier. And anybody that's written about their experiences, they've talked about it, they've listened, they went out in the hills, went for a brew, even our walk, talk and brews, that's why they are so successful. You go out in the hills, you walk up, you have a blether with people that have been through the same journey or have had similar experiences to you and come out the other side. And it just gives you that peace of mind that you're you're not on your own. There are people that have been that journey and come out the other side. That's the scary part of sitting thinking, right, I'm on my own. I've got nothing here. But everybody's got worth. Everybody's got something to give in life. If you're still breathing, you've got something to give. For me personally, it's hitting the hills, going for a walk, fresh air, nature, connecting. I'm social media daft. I, I know this is addiction for me now, and I'm constantly looking at other people living their life and going, they don't seem to have a great life, but I'm doing, and it kind of takes your mind away of what they're doing. So for me personally, it's gone up the hills, even eating good, and I might not look at it now, I've put on a wee bit of weight, but it's, uh, I think eating Looking good, neck. <laughs> I think eating clean, walking, exercising. Exercising's a good fix for a, that couple of hours, but the problems are still going to be there. It's trying to get the rooted problems as well. There's a thing called the inner child where you talk about the traumas and the stress and sometimes we don't want to fucking dig it up because it's scary. It is, it's really scary. For you, yourself, are you still exercising? Are you still keeping fit? Are you still... Yeah, I've got my kiddies at the minute. So yeah, well, I always down tools when the kiddies are here. So I ditch work. I uh, I don't hit the gym and I try and spend every hour I can with them because you know I've only got them for a month over the summer and they go back and I'll regret not... I've wasted that time, but once they go back, I try and get myself into a routine where I know a plan. I try and have goals like anybody else. So I try and hit the gym at least three times a week if I can, mm-hmm. even if it's for half an hour, an hour. I know I've done it and it's something I've achieved. And those small goals that you set, they all add up and they give you wee confidence builders. Of course it is. That's all about taking the steps to the, the goal and the progression. It's not about the finishing line and getting to the finishing line and achieving it. It's about enjoying the journey, trying to stay in the present moment and enjoying it, especially... When you were your kids, were you serving then? No, I wasn't serving uh, when they, they were only seven and five now. Right. Um, so they came after service. And in many ways, that's good because, you know, I, I, I was able to be there as they were, mm-hmm. you know, first born and have, have, a, have a kind of hands on part. Whereas, but I know a lot of I know a lot of veterans and still serving soldiers don't because they're not given that that, that privilege. And yeah, you miss, a, you miss a big part. You give up a lot. Uh, especially if you're. It's your full life in it. If you've yeah. got kids, then you're away from them. That's the mental side of it as well. It's not just what you're seeing in battle. It's the mental side of being away from your family, away from your friends. 
when you're there, if you do, you have phones or do you have can when you're. Yeah, it depends. It depends where you are and what you are. You have Bluey's letters. You have the sat phones. Sometimes you've got phones you can get back. You've got access to IT and, and on the computer and FaceTime and stuff. But a lot of the time you, you're not. You, there's only certain allocation. And if you've got a couple of hundred guys and you've only got a couple of hours of, you know, you're, you're toiling to get any real quality time in terms of messaging or, or writing home or stuff. But yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the things that they, they give up. So I, I think it's one of the things that when they come back, they should just be given a little hand up to say, you know, this is this is going to help with it, whether it's relationship building or whether it's housing, jobs, community, because community is a big part of it. When you lose that community and you speak to any veteran, the biggest thing they'll miss is the banter and being around the guys and girls and being out operations. Once they come back, they lose that sense of kind of duty, purpose, responsibility and community. So that's why we try and recreate that. We go out in the hills and you're blethering with people that have, oh, I remember when we were in Ireland or remember Iraq. And, you know, you're you're speaking to people that speak the same language and that in itself brings them back to where they are and they feel free in a safe environment to talk. And that's what it's all about, safety, because if you're speaking to psychologists, and I'm not putting psychologists down, but they are learning from books. If you're if you served in Iraq or whatever it is, you want to speak to somebody who understands how you're feeling. Do you know what I mean? Do you think you've came, obviously you've got the social media, you've got the, the platform now to obviously help others. Do, lot, do you get a lot more people coming towards you? Does that, how does you, how are you dealing with that? Because it must be a lot of weight on your shoulders now. I think that's one of the things. I think, well, I, I always thought that I was quite solid. I had this solid mental resilience. But as I was starting to lose people through social media, that, that was affecting my own mental health. I was start, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd, I'd encourage somebody to go to the gym or get out the door or get up the hills, I'd feel good about myself. And then that was that had a kind of counter side to it because as more and more people were getting in touch and I was trying to juggle people and speak to them and reassure them, people were falling through my fingers and that was affecting me and I thought, I can't, I can't sustain it, I'm, I'm one person. So that was the reason. Were you blaming yourself for some of them? I think you do sometimes life. because you can't, you're not there. You're not at the end. You're not there to answer everybody on social media and not within the time frames they want. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that can be frustrating because they'll, they'll suddenly have a perception of you that probably isn't real because we can't physically, you've got 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 followers. How do you keep them all and how do you interact with them and, and keep them all happy? You can. You can only do what you can. And you can't blame yourself because what happens is if you blame yourself, you've always the matter that took your energy levels down there. So how can you help other people then? It's about doing what you can and realising, you know what, I can't save the fucking world. We're not gods or whatever. We can't save everybody. What we can do is work with what we know and how we can create awareness. So for the stuff like Who Dares Wins, how did all that come about? How did you end up getting that role in that part? So it was a massive show. Yeah, it's a big show and, and still ongoing. And at the time I was I was down on the books to help out in the TV industry with um, anybody that wanted help from a kind of military consultancy point of view. So make sure guys weren't firing weapons in the wrong shoulder and had the never ending magazines and weapons back to front and all that. That's that's the kind of thing I wanted to do about the continuity side. And there wasn't a lot of work for it. And if there was, it was in London or abroad. And then someone contacted me and said, I've got this show, it's, it's SES, who dares wins, but they don't have any SES, it's all SB, SBS guys have got on it. So I went down, met with the production team that made it Minnow, and they were like, we'll, we'll just put the cameras up and leave you to it. You, you, can, you can just run it as you want. And that, the autonomy of that felt quite genuine and it felt like it was something I wanted to be involved in rather than a kind of typical, you know, kind of fake TV show where it was, it was supposed to be reality, but it wasn't really. Mm-hmm. Did you enjoy it then? I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the first series and I enjoyed the, the, the distance travelled with a lot of the people that were on it. I felt like we'd made a real impact on their lives. That was people that we were setting off that had a a real outer coating of mental resilience having been through that and confidence to get through, you know, boundaries that they probably wouldn't think they would have if, had they not been through otherwise. And everybody else that watched it as well. It was a pop- very popular show. It was a training as tough as it looked. I think, well, we, we, we only had kind of a week with these guys and, and, and it's it's six months selection. So there's obviously only certain things we could do. Having said that, some of the individual things that we took out of it, like the fan dance and the CFT, that's, they're exactly the same as what you do in selection. It's just, you do it on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. No, it's as tense, but... Yeah. So for the motivational speaking and stuff, because I know you're doing all this, how did that come about also? Have you, 
Are you enjoying speaking to everybody else and trying to lift their spirits and guide them a bit? Are you enjoying that? Yeah, I love, I love travelling around. I love seeing different organisations and, and, and what they're doing and the little things that they might want support in, whether it's teamwork, leadership, motivation, elite performance. And I find that through, through some of the experiences I've had and some of the journeys and some of the learning points from it, I think if you can adapt to that, and you can you can you can do anything. So there's a lot of positive messages that come through it, and I love it. I love I love doing it. That's good for your kids. Or that would you, if they want to join, would you advise them to join, or would you kind of say nah? It, it it's a good question, and I think it would depend where the military is at that time. Mm-hmm. I think whenever you want to, if you want to join the military, there's a lot of things you want to do, and operations is part of it. Nobody wants to join the army, serve 22 years, get out, and all I've done is kind of guard Buckingham Palace or something. You, you, you want to do operations. Having said that, you don't want it to be too... You don't want to get in an operational cycle you can't get out of, and that's why we're seeing problems now where promotional side, the training, the, and all the other stuff, the character building stuff that comes with the military wasn't happening because guys were just coming from operation to operation. That can burn you out, and it can have a, a kind of negative effect on the military as well because people will think, that's me, I've done my conflict, I'm getting out now, mm. rather than seeing it as a career. So it does damage on, on both counts, especially now where we see the regulars are, are shrinking. Does many people last, do they last? Does a lot of people last the 22 years or whatever? Do they, do they get to that level or do, is it numbers dropping massively? I think now you would see the numbers dropping. Traditionally, um, kind of prior to 2000, I think you would have saw a lot of people come through and do their 22 years and see it as a career with sporadic operations, whether it's the Falklands, the First Gulf and Northern Ireland. Now, I think if you looked at 2000 onwards, that you'll see a lot of people have come out in really short cycles because they go do operations and think, right, if that's operations, A, I've seen it, and B, it's not for me for a long term. Is the numbers, is it because there's more wars then, because people are seeing that much shit that they want to drop out, or is it, is it, is it, is it as bad as it was in the 60s or 70s? Or? I think it's a mix of things. I think that I think that some of the, some of the support elements, so that you, you're seeing guys having a career within the military where there's all the things that are out with operations. So all the times that you go to different countries and you do training, you, you learn about that country and you've got the kind of R&R there. You've got your promotional courses so that when you leave, regardless of the operations, you've had a career that's shaped you in one way or another based on everything you've done over that 22 years. And it's been a kind of gradual hill that's climbed and manageable. Whereas kind of post 2003 with the operational cycle, Guys are going in there and just at 100 miles an hour for three to five years and like, oh, that's me. I've done like five, six tours, which traditionally you might, in a generation before, it would take you 22 years to do that number of tours. And they're just coming out and being burnt out and with all all that trauma that's come with it with people that they've lost left and right of them. That's where, so the 22 years, they're, they're getting kind of, they're getting worked too hard. I think at the minute with the operational cycle, um, post-2003, I think that's what's happened. I think a lot of people have become either um, disenchanted with what conflict is or the operational burnout's been too much or they're not getting time to do the pr- promotional side of it that they want to do or the other things that they, they, they kind of wanted to do within the military hasn't happened. And coupled with that, some of the opportunities have come alongside conflicts like the security industry. That's that's taken a lot of the, the military away where they say, well, look, I can can earn in five years what I'd earn in my entire career in, in the military. So I'll go and do this and at least I'll be kind of set for life. And that's a very hard cycle to get out of. So you're trying to, obviously doing it for the money, try to blast it out so they can get out quicker. But realistically, it's, it's really fucking their mind because they're doing that yeah. much stuff. It's scary. It is. It's, it's scary to think that that's the kind of shit that's going on. It's scary to think. Did you see before you got an operation like that? Did you, do you get briefed or is it just a case of, look, you're going there? Such a place for do you get a timeline or do you get told? Or? Yeah, there's there's normally briefs and there's very few operations you'll go on where there's not some kind of brief and, and training leading up to it. Mm. But in the past, you may have done a six month tour in Northern Ireland. There would be about six months build up to that, and people would get a whole load of leaving, a load of training, work within your multiples. You'd get all the environmental stuff about what what the what Northern Ireland's like, and then you'd go off and do your tour. And even within that tour, you'd get a period of R and R. And then after you'd come back, you'd have leave, and you probably wouldn't go back out on an operational tour for a year, two years, three years. 
now guys are doing six months coming back and a few weeks later a few months later going straight back out could be iraq again could be afghanistan and although that's slowing down now there was a chunk there after 2003 where that was taking its toll see after an operation you came home did some people how was the mindset then was it kind of like this doesn't feel real going back into normality and did that feel weird yeah i think what we forget is that we take normal, ordinary people, that's what our servicemen and women are, myself included, and we put them in extraordinary situations mm -hmm. and then we lift them back up and we put them back in, you know, 45 Main Street in, in, in Glasgow or Edinburgh and they go to the shops and they cut the grass and, and those are very difficult hats to keep on and off, particularly with some of the stuff they've been doing, particularly when they've been hypervigilant for such a long stay mm -hmm. and then come back home. It's very hard to switch on and off. Because there's a, there's a paranoia kick in then. Do you feel weird that walking down the street and do you, are you constantly on edge? Obviously, whatever you've seen in operations to come, and do you get paranoid? Do you try to sleep in noises? Are you up like because that's what you're trained to do? To, yeah, to be aware. I think so, and I think the vast majority of servicemen and women that come back from operations, those are typical symptoms where it's very hard to switch off and relax and zone out. You're you're always in this state of you know. You'll go in somewhere it's crowded and you'll be just wondering where the exits are and who that person is that came in and sat down there with a backpack. You just It's very hard to come out and extract yourself from that and just relax. And when you're going at that state, the mind's under constant pressure. Yeah, did you, are you, are you dealing with it better now then that you're out and you've been out for a few years now? Is it, everything been coming, is it becoming easier? Is it still the same? Are you still aware of the situation? I think there's certain elements that I still struggle with. The, the hypervigilance is one, sleeping is another, but there's a whole host of things that can help and I've certainly found it helpful tapping into those. I've you know, spoke myself to psychologists, I've had certain elements of medication that help with sleep. I certainly find speaking and sharing to other people who have been through like-minded stuff very helpful. I'd, I'd recommend that to anybody as, as the kind of first step. Particularly, I think people think army or whatever and they think well there's this element of macho stuff but if they see someone in special forces at the front line that's coming out with it, I think it's easier then to come out themselves and say you know what I've struggled with one or two of that stuff myself and that's the first step. It doesn't open doors to people so you think you're, you're standing doing your motivational talks that's a bit of expressing yourself that's a bit of trying to get you're expressing yourself but it's also helping you as well because you're kind of getting it out there and other people come to you and say they've got that same problem so you're kind of not alone as well if you know what I mean yeah and it's very it's very funny because when I when I first started somebody said oh it'd be good if you came in and did a talk and I thought I'm not really I'm not really a motivational talker like a lot of army I'm capable of standing up in front of people and talking but I didn't I didn't know I had the right messages to say and I felt that after I'd told my story I felt almost like when I'd written, written down my manuscript it was like a whole weight had been released it was like I'd, I'd almost rid myself of a lot that was kept up that I had, I had to express myself so I think every time I stand up in front of people and tell my story or any time you sit down and write it, there's a therapeutic element to yeah, that. Yeah, that's therapy for you. Makes you feel good. Was there any stuff like yoga or stuff like that? And the, the people, is that there? Like breathing techniques? Or? There's a whole host of stuff. So yeah, yoga, meditation. There's an app I've downloaded recently called Calm. I'd recommend it to anybody. It's got sleep, stories, meditation, uh, sounds, even stuff, you're going off to sleep, you set it for kind of five minutes and it has waterfalls, all that kind of stuff. That has a whole host of stuff on it that's really helpful. So yeah, I would say animals, animals are really good. You get a pet, you, you horseback UK is mm -hmm. famous for that and they've got brave hound and stuff and they found it working with animals mm -hmm. and, and stuff helps. So there's a whole host of stuff out there. It's just mm -hmm. tapping into what works. And it's trying to get what's right for you as well because not necessarily it's right for you, it's right for everybody else including myself. When you did your, um, you wrote a book as well. Yeah. When did that come out? So the SAS Leadership uh, book already came out. Uh, I wrote my autobiography, The Pilgrim. The MOD keep putting the blockers on that. They keep saying it will set a dangerous president and we can't tell people, you know, and yeah, I watch everyone else, especially from the show that have written their books and yeah, it pinches because there's that element of injustice and there's nothing I've got to tell that people haven't heard. They've heard it on Who Dares Wins, they've heard on the Channel 5 show. I've spoke about it in the public speaking. It's been on the Discovery and History channel. Mm -hmm. There's no secrets in that book that nobody hasn't heard. However... I just wish that the MOD would just be a le less 
prehistoric in their approach and say, mm. you know, it's not this 30 years wait. People know about selection. People know that special forces are away working and just let me tell my story because everybody else has, you know. So they try to put the blockers on it? Yeah, and as recent as two weeks ago, I said to the MOD, I'll give you three options. I can write this as fiction if you want. I can take out the, the, the capture chapter. You can blue line whatever line parts you want and give me back an edited copy and they refuse them all. So it just feel, it feels almost personal in a way because you see everybody else, you know, Foxy brought his one out a couple of weeks ago. Aunt Middleton's has been out. It just feels... Of in guys, in in 2018. Is that, just, true though? is that just against you? Do you think some... Well, it might not just be against me, but I think the arguments they use for not putting my book out mm-hmm. are kind of hypocritical to what the other books have been Aye. out there. If it's setting a dangerous precedent, well, what have all these other ones done? If you're saying that we can't talk about SF operations, well, what are some of these other ones doing? You know, if you're saying, well, we can't say we're working with intelligence services or no one knows about your capture, well, guess what? Everybody knows about it. It's all over Sky News, so let's not kid each other. So then what happens if you release it? I don't. I think they would put the block on it to yeah. release it. Um, I, I'm I'm lost. I, I I need a lot a lawyer that will come on and take the MOD because I think a decent lawyer would yeah, be able. Well, to... if any lawyers are out there, man, help Colin get his book out. Give him a shout. Give him a message because yeah, I'd appreciate every, it. Everybody's got a story, Colin, and it's no fair that your story's kind of it's not getting out there because there's a lot of frustration there. Because a lot of people relate to your story as well and try and get the help to I don't know whatever it is. It's on the book, but for people to. Everybody's got an interest in reading it. We've all been through some shit. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Could you not change? They not. You've changed bits of chapter of the book for to try and get it fluff up a bit. I've changed whole bits to appease the MOD to try and get the book out there, but they just they don't want it out. And and there's nothing I haven't said, and there's nothing that will risk soldiers' lives, and that's the main thing. And that's that's the only bit I really care about, and and so the fact they've put the blockers on it, it does that. It can only come down to personal because there's no part of that book that I haven't already told on either national TV or any other platform. Because your stuff is everywhere. I was I've been reading up all week because I know you were coming on. It is everywhere about your capture and this and that. And like I say, that's a story that people and it's obviously for yourself it's grim, but for people of that that. That's what grips people in, all the stuff being captured and what you've went through and that's the, what your book sells. Yeah, I think there's one side of it, it's the, it's the SF side that people always want to read about and I think another one is the journey, the life journey and I think there's a lot of good that comes out of that because very few people live their lives and don't go through some kind of trauma or don't experience stress to some level. I think there's messages in that book that, that give a lot of people hope and will, will hopefully if the book gets out there, do a lot of good. So yeah, I hope I hope it does one day. Is there anything yeah in the pipeline to get it out there? Or you're trying everything. Well, that was the last one with the with the MOD. I know personnel have changed, so I hope they would they would see sense. But 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 Foxy's got through, and and my, and my never. Um, I I don't know. I'd I'd like. I think a decent lawyer would be able to look at the MOD and say, look, with a few tweaks, we can make this book work. Just how like what what is it you want us to do to get this book out there and yeah have you spoke to the other boys then who've got their books out as well how can they not guide you and put you onto somebody else to i think they've they've got i think one of the things one of the things is when you have you when you're starting to form form your own journey and your own path it, it, it it's it's harder to be able to help other people because they're they've got their own path they're trying to make it work they're they're, they're carving out a tv and a book career for themselves it's very hard for them then to come in and try and help you from a flank. And I get that, uh, I, get, I get that side of it. But, you know, I think probably I have more of a story to tell in my book. I was, I was involved in some quite high profile operations. So there is a, a story there. And I think the problem is that the MOD might not want, they might not want elements of the capture to come out. They might, they might feel that there's an element of um, duty of care failure or support or that the SF world might not be what it's what it's deemed to be. But for me, I don't think it'll do any damage from that side. People realise what a vulnerable position sometimes SF are in. I think there's a I think by the time you finish the last page of it, you've got a kind of uplifting feeling that, you know, no matter what adversity you come through, mm-hmm. there's a life at the end of it. Do you think that would scare people but to join maybe the army if they read it and go, fuck that, I'm not going through that? 
Well, uh, it doesn't necessarily tell. Uh, it's certainly not an atypical army story. Mm. I think that would be. I think. SF would be the kind of tip of the spear part. So I don't think it would put anybody off. It might put a lot of people forward for, for going for the army, certainly hearing about some of the adventures. And let's not forget, the whole book isn't really just the SF part. It's my, it's my childhood. It's the general army. It's the SF part and the career after. So the SF part's only really part of it. I need to read this book. <laughs> I need to read this book. You need to get the book out there. When you were ca so you, see, when you were captured for the day as well, you had, it was the British army that came. Yeah, so we were captured, we'd, we'd went down to the border, come back up, got captured and were held in the police station in Basra. And fortunately for us, um, a, a, green, a Green Army unit had kind of put two and two together and realised we were in there. And yeah, they had a bit of armour and stuff and, and they, there was a big riot outside the police station. There was fire and RPGs and all sorts. And luckily we managed to, to get rescued, um, just right place, right time, as opposed to being... Wrong place, wrong time before. Exactly, and you, like I say, you were lucky because I read that you were blindfolded. Yeah. Naked. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, and, and, and the SF prepare you to a degree for that. They'll never prepare you fully. It's very hard to, so that element helped. Um, and I think a lot of the childhood stuff helped as well. There was a kind of, there was an element of no badly how beaten you are. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you get through it the next day and certainly that was with me there. You know, I was certainly always conscious of the fact that no matter how badly physically I'm broken down, mm -hmm. I can mend mentally. I'm the kind of gatekeeper yeah. of how I feel. And that's, a, that's an amazing way to look at thinking you are in control of your mindset and you've obviously learned that from your childhood, from speaking to you that whether it's the abuse mentally or whatever and then dragging that through till when you get captured. Does that kind of relate to what happened when you were younger then? You kind of just accept it becoming, you know what, you can beat me black and blue, you can fucking kill me, but you ain't going to break me up here. Did yeah. you become, do you become numb then, Colin? Do you become, like, fearful, fearless? Do you become like, fuck it, basically? Yeah, you know to do? I, I wouldn't say it's numb. It might be numb physically. It's certainly not numb mentally, and I would never say that you become fearless. Anybody, any soldier that tells you they're fearless or they've never feared is a liar. There's loads of times I've been afraid, and well, there are loads of times in the future I'll be afraid. So anyone tells you it tells you that it's it's nonsense. It's how you manage the fear that's the key. It's what what you do with it and how you shape it to your best advantage, and not those of the the people on the other side. Mm -hmm. Fair play to you, mate. And uh, for the future going forward, what's the plans for you? What have you got? The public speaking is going really well. I, I do the motion capture for the video games, which is in Edinburgh, Rockstar. I, I love that as well. The charity's taken off. I'm ambassador for a number of charities. I do whatever I can for veterans, anybody in mental health. Love the charity football. Hoping to yes, I get old Tommy Sheridan. We kind of need to replace him anyway, mate, because my back is so carrying him, mate. He's in his sixties or seventies. <laughs> do you know what I mean? He, he needs to gear up, man. But he tries. He tries, Tommy. Um, the computer game stuff. Because I was talking to Gordon yesterday. He's a big computer game fan. Is uh, so. What is that then? Yeah, so, I, I mean, I've been with, with, with Rockstar Games working with them for about 10 years now. And they started from, even then, a, a successful company. But I've watched them just grow and grow and explode. And the technology now is phenomenal. And I can't say too much about the game side of it, because a lot of it's more secret than what it was when I was in the Special Forces. But the motion capture side of it is basically a large, massive kind of room, warehouse size, covered in the balls, and you do the movement, right. and then it goes straight onto the video games, and they just put a so different you, face. So you're that guy that does all the like, moves, rolling about, and I do, a, I, do, I do a lot of the motion capture, and when you finish the game, you'll see in the credits, it comes up thanks to, to Colin McLaughlin. That's brilliant, so, man. That's yeah. amazing. I think I've seen Colin McGregor doing one, was that... What's the one? What's the army? The Call of Duty. Call of Duty. Yeah. So that's the kind of stuff you do? Yeah, so I've done the Grand Theft Auto series. Oh, and yeah, uh, yeah okay. so I've, I've been working for 10 years, so you can imagine the sort of games I've yeah. been involved in. But I, I love it. Every day is different. One oh, day you're brilliant. a fighter pilot, next minute you're on a horse. So, yeah. That's fucking brilliant. Yeah. And uh, I'd just like to thank you, man, for your, your story. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for getting out there and all the good work you do. Being brave, mate. And like I say, anybody that's serving or in out in battle, man, it takes a lot of balls. But it takes bigger balls to admit you've got problems. So for anybody in the struggle and to try to get contact, can we say it again how we can try and um, create awareness and get people the help that maybe needed? Yeah, totally. We're always we're always here. We've got the Who Dares Cares Facebook page. We've got the website who hyphen dares hyphen cares dot co dot uk. We'll have the app and the website up and running twenty four seven. 
and yeah, we're, we're, we're always, there's somebody always there, so just reach out, let us know, and there'll be someone that can help. Amazing, mate. Just like to say thanks for coming on. And thanks for seeing me. And, um, we've also got a documentary out on the 2nd of September, um, the homeless documentary that we made in Glasgow, so people can subscribe to the page and let people know what this documentary is. It's very colourful. Um, and hope you enjoy it. But like I say, mate, I appreciate it. Thanks for everything again, mate. Pleasure. Have a good day. Cheers.